Hello, it's Bruce T here with another podcast. This podcast is based upon Mark 1, 4 to 11, and it's a scenario where Jesus is baptised by John in the River Jordan. Now, we know from Mark's Gospel, it's quite a short Gospel, it's practical, and it's very immediate. The word immediate is used quite a lot and shows the quickness of things happening. So let's get back to the reading. So John came baptising in the wilderness and preaching the baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. All the country of Judea and all those of Jerusalem went out to him. They were baptised by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John was clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. He preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I. The throng of his sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and loosen. I baptise you in water, but he will baptise you in the Holy Spirit. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. Immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. A voice came out of the sky, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now we just need to talk about the background of baptism. In the Western world we have two types, pedo-baptism and credo-baptism. Pedo-baptism is where you bring a child to be baptised in the church or christened. And credo-baptism is when an adult is baptised by going fully immersed under the water to show to people that they have decided to follow Jesus. So, Jesus was born into the Jewish world, into the Jewish faith. And at eight days old, he was circumcised. Genesis 17.12 says, He who is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every male throughout your generations, he who is born in the house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring. So Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day, and he was also named. In Luke 2.21 it says, When eight days were fulfilled for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. For purification after childbearing, see Leviticus 12, the length of days depended on the gender of the child. So Jesus was born a Jew of a Jewish mother and went through the Jewish rituals as described in our Old Testament. Later, when Jesus was talking to a Samaritan woman, he reaffirmed that salvation was from the Jews. In John 4.22, he said, You worship that which you don't know. We worship that which we know, for salvation is from the Jews. Jesus the Messiah had been born into the world, was now baptised and about to start his ministry. So we think about John's mission. Remember, when Elijah was assessing his ministry after he defeated the prophets of Baal, in 1 Kings 18, God said to him, Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all the knees of which have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. So there was a remnant in Israel who believed God in Elijah's time. The people coming out to see John repent proved there was still a lot of interest in the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and they wanted to know God. Within the role of every prophet, they had to remind the people of their covenant with God, their agreement. John came preparing the way. People were expecting and waiting for a prophet and Messiah from God, and they had waited for 400 years. John was not a celebrity, a politician, but a prophet of God. He was there to prepare the way to make the announcement. Just when the circus is coming to the town, people need to know. And you'll find people putting posters up all over the place to advertise. John was there to prepare the way for Jesus. This was a fulfilment of scripture. In Isaiah 43, in the Web English Bible, it says, The voice of one who calls out, Prepare the way of Yahweh in the wilderness. Make a level highway in the desert for our God. John pointed people to Jesus, as we should. 
Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. So pointing people to Jesus for their life and through eternity is the best thing we can do. Pointing them to yourself is egotistical for you and destructive for them. Always point to Jesus. Ryle says we forget the morning star in the full blaze of the sun. So John's role was to prepare the people announcing and pointing to Jesus. As John said in John 3.30, he must increase, I must decrease. Because when push comes to shove, it's Jesus who saved you, Jesus who's paid the price on the cross of Calvary for your sins, past, present and future. And Jesus who says, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you peace. And he's there through this life and also in eternity. Following a human who's only there for a short while is not the right thing to do. It's best to follow Jesus through this life and eternity. So we think about recognising and introducing Jesus. The term, by God referring to Jesus as his son, was an assertion of Jesus' divinity. During his time on earth, Jesus was both man and God. So he went through the biblical Jewish rituals, but also asserted he was God the Son. And as he says in John 5.18, For this cause, therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also called God his own Father, making himself equal with God. It was also the seed of the woman, which was stated back in Genesis, Genesis 3.15 says, I'll put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. This is a concept that is developed throughout the Bible. And Ryle says it has a constantly increasing clearness. Bible scholars talk about this being progressive revelation. You find also in this passage that we've read, the Trinity. Although the word Trinity is not in the Bible, the Bible constantly alludes to the Trinity. In this scene in Mark that we've read, a voice came out of the sky. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That was the God the Father speaking. And then we had the Son being baptised and the Holy Spirit immediately coming up from the water. He saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descended on him like a dove. He was baptised at the beginning of his ministry, fully immersed, fully equipped. So what does this mean for us? In Mark 1.8, John says, I baptised you in water, but he will baptise you in the Holy Spirit. And this is a very necessary help for the person accepting Jesus as their saviour and desiring to follow him. Living a life that's pleasing to him, accepting his call on their life. That is the task he has for us to do and fulfilling that call. The Holy Spirit there is to empower you, direct you, give you words to speak, direction, comfort, confidence. And then there are ministerial gifts that the Holy Spirit may use through you and also personal gifts, such as speaking in tongues, which is a way of helping you to build yourself up in the faith. So please, if you haven't already, ask Jesus into your life today. And we say, thank you, Jesus, for coming into the world. Thank you for your example. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for being resurrected. Thank you for sending the Holy Spirit. Thank you for praying for us. Amen. So may the Lord bless you, may the Lord keep you, may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. Enable you to live the Christian life in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. So until next time, bye for now.